Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have to say it's a real pleasure to be back in person and to meet you all. I have a lot of fun on this conference. And um, yeah, let's have some more fun with Brett, the broadband um, reflector experiment for axon detection. I already introduced you the concept on the last part for us, but let's go briefly over it again and then look at some of the first you know, things that we did in the lab over the past year. Okay, so what's our motivation? Well, um, we want to search for axions in the sort of milli-electron volt range or even higher. And you all know, okay, we can use the cavity concept at microelectron volts. It works perfectly. But if you want to go to higher masses, well, your cavity gets smaller because you want to be still resonant with the photon frequency. So, um, you know, um, the volume gets smaller and smaller, the cavity quality factor goes down. So if you want to do this method at the milli-electron volt, this gets really hairy and it's basically impossible. Okay, so what can we do at the milli-electron volt range? Well, we can be very radical and we can say, okay, let's get completely rid of the cavity and set the quality factor of our experiment effectively to one. So how does this look like? Well, this is basically the dish antenna approach that has been actually um, been proposed 10 years ago now, so long already. Um, it's basically a cavity with Q equal one. So how does this look like? Well, you have just a conducting wall, which is open. So if you have axions, they can convert to photons on the wall, and you have a magnetic field parallel to the wall. So now you can make this wall as large as you want, because you don't have a resonance anymore, so your wavelengths can actually be much, much shorter than the size of the wall. So your signals now scales with the area of this conducting surface. So you overcome this fact that you don't have a Q with a large area. And actually, for the higher masses in the background free um, limit, you can even show that Q equal 1 gives you the best scan rate. And of course, obviously, you don't have to tune this, so it's experimentally very easy to, to do. The bad thing about this is, look at this magnetic field. It has a very weird shape. So you have to spend a lot of money if you want to build a magnet like this. So our proposal is, well, can you do something like this but use a solenoid magnet? Um, so we came up with this coaxial dish antenna concept, which is basically saying, well, you can use a cylindrical dish antenna and put this in a solenoid magnet, so you have your magnetic field going vertical here. And then what the cylindrical dish will do, you will have these photons emitted perpendicular to the dish surface outside, and then you just put a reflector geometry inside, which again focuses the radiation on a common focal spot where you can put your favorite photon detector. Um, so this is great. Um, we did a lot of calculations how feasible this is. So we looked at various um, detectors in the milli-electron volt range, uh, bolometers and single photon counters that I don't have the time to go through in detail. But you can calculate sensitivities for all these sensors. Nevertheless, if you look at our paper, um, you will find that you actually can probe down to the QCD axion band um, in around this region. So it's really, really nice. And well, we, we published this and we thought, okay, which journal should we go? Should we put this in JCAP? Should we put this in PRD? It's a concept that people have come up 10 years ago with. Well, let's try PRL. The thing which happened is we ended up on a title page of PRL. <laughs> So um, this is really nice. This is a simulation of our setup in the RF regime. So this gives us, of course, even more backwind to try to make this thing real. So um, our long-term goal is, of course, to pair this with a, um, with a solenoid magnet. For example, the ADMX EFR magnet, which we will get next year at Fermilab. We are already starting to um, move it and decommission it from where it's at the moment. This would allow us to build a dish antenna with an area of four square meter, which would already be quite nice to go where we want to go. Um, we just very recently got a first prototype of this. So here you see um, a drawing of exactly the setup, but cut up in, in several pieces, which we got a couple of weeks ago. And um, we started characterizing one piece of this, um, actually already the beginning of this year, a prototype piece with various different um, mechanical methods. So you can do like mechanical touches on your piece, you can reflect a laser beam, you can reflect a test pattern, and you can analyze sort of how good is your surface and for what frequency ranges it would be a suitable reflector. 
And in this case, um, our measurements consistently tell us that you know, the surface properties give us a roughness with standard machining methods at the order of 100 micrometer. This is probably something um, you know very well. Um, so, so sort of for the 10 gigahertz range, this is still perfect. For the higher frequencies, you need to do something better. But let's talk first about sort of lower frequencies. So what happens at a uh, little bit lower frequencies? Um, it's basically you get a coherent uh, wave which gets focused here on the focal spot. Um, we did a lot of simulations how this looks like. So this is the coherent field distribution which you want to pick up at the focus. So we designed a custom horn antenna which can couple to this field distribution. Um, so this is the horn in reality. So we actually got this horn. Um, this is me holding it. These are the typical dimensions. And we started characterizing this horn if it fulfills you know, the electromagnetic properties that we want. In particular, what you want to know is, does it match to the beam shape that you want to detect? So what you do is you do a far field measurement. So you, you mount these horns on some rotation stage and let them communicate with each other. So you rotate them with respect to each other and uh, measure the transmission. It's a very simple measurement. But com by comparing that to the simulation, you can actually find out whether it couples to the right near field pattern that I just showed you a moment ago. And the results of this measurement, well, this is the grad student who actually did most of this work and deserves a lot of credit and to give you a little bit of you know, scale of this chamber that we have to do this. Um, the result of this um, measurement looks like this. So you see in blue, you have the simulation at 10 gigahertz. In orange, you have our measurement. And you see they agree quite well. Um, so you get a little bit of reduction in axon sensitivity, but it's really at the percent level. It really looks nice. Um, this goes up to 15 gigahertz, where the situation is even better. So we think we have a horn antenna now that we can pair with our reflector that will work really nicely. So we have the reflector now, we have the horn. The only thing that's left, which we need, of course, is our data acquisition system to actually do an experiment. And for us, the challenge really is, since it's a broadband experiment, we need a broadband data acquisition. So if you want a 4 gigahertz bandwidth, which is what we are aiming for, you have 8 giga samples per second, which means you get something like 8 gigabytes of data per second. So the challenge is to have a real-time data reduction, which we do with an FPGA board, in our case, the Salinx Z0111, where we implement a 16 FFT with a 500 megahertz bandwidth in parallel, and subsequently, um, in real-time, average down our spectra. Um, this is also already implemented, and uh, we are extensively testing this at the moment. Um, if we put all this together, which is what we are doing within these days, this is sort of the um, sensitivities which we are expecting, just for hidden photons without any magnet yet. And you see really the power of this approach is that you can get really broadband compared to you know, the existing limits. But this is, of course, not where we stop. Um, we will pair this with a magnet. Um, if not the ADMX EFR magnet, maybe with a, first with a little bit weaker magnet at Argon, which is also available to us. Um, if you just use this Ford Tesla magnet and do a room temperature experiment, you can even think of getting competi com uh, <laughs> competitive with the cast limits. Um, if you use the 10 Tesla MRI magnet, which we will have for ADMX, soon at Fermilab, then you can even probe a significant amount of the um, ARP parameter space. So this is sort of for gigahertz frequencies, but of course our long-term goal is to go to terahertz and even higher. So we have also a prototype experiment in the pipeline which sort of brackets this from the other side of the frequency range, which we call infrared. So this will um, do the same, but at infrared frequencies. And here the game is really completely different. So um, here the emission from the whole surface here actually is incoherent. So what happens is that you have to take account the incoherence effects of the axion field, which is essentially boils down to the velocity distribution of the axion dark matter. So you will get a focal spot of incoherent photons, which will follow, um, which is smeared out basically by a millimeter, basically given by the um, axion velocity distribution. So we need a sensor in the end, which is about the size of a millimeter, which is like 1,000 times larger than our wavelength. 
Um, so this is um, what we need. What we have um, at the moment in the lab is an SNSPD from um, MIT. They claim they can already do this one millimeter, but we first learn how to use, you know, their smaller SNSPDs. So what is an SNSPD? It's a superconducting nanowire single photon detector. And the thing you do is basically um, you run a current um, through a superconducting nanowire, which you meander like this. Um, and if a photon, an infrared photon, hits this SNSPD, it breaks the superconductivity locally. So this current cannot run through the SNSPD anymore and instead runs through an amplifier which you connect somewhere else. And then you can detect the pulse and by counting the pulses, simply count how many photons have arrived at your SNSPD. As I said, we are testing this extensively at the moment at Fermilab. We just started recently with this. This is the grad student who is doing these tests in front of the cryostat. Very nice compact ADR we have for this. Um, we already um, see the superconducting properties of the SNSPD. This is not super difficult, but we also already see first dark counts, which is really exciting. Of course, the long-term goal for these tests is to do something really novel, which is measuring the dependence of the um, SNSPD efficiency as a function of incident angle of the photons. Usually, detector people who develop these SNSPDs, they think that um, you know, everyone needs normal incidence. We, of course, don't need normal incidence. Um, so our long-term goal is to try to um, test what happens, not under normal incidents. If you look at the slides, you will see that even um, with the SNSPDs, you should be able, um, with a one-day measurement for the hidden photons, to get world leading limits in the, um, in the infrared regime. So this is the plot. With an, what we expect with an already existing SNSPD and the setup which we are currently preparing also at Fermilab in an existing cryostat. Again, all those are just our pilot experiments. Um, in the end, the long-term goal would, of course, be to sort of um, probe this parameter space um, up here, which for some reason you cannot see in this with, with the beamer. But um, I hope I could convince you in this talk that this is a very nice concept and that we are doing real steps in our lab to actually make it real. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Are there comments, questions? Um, maybe I missed it. So the SN SPDs are 10 micrometers order of? Yeah, so. And do you need a detector of a millimeter size? Yes, you need a detector of a millimeter size. Um, there are um, SNSPDs. So this one has a side length of 400 micrometer. So it's almost the size that we need. Um, we would probably get decent efficiency with this one already. Um, it's the one um, which was used for this um, other multi-layer optical um, haloscope in the optical. I forgot the name. Um, never mind. So it, it already demonstrated that it worked. We are also working together with JPL. They um, have a sort of a combination of multiple SNSPDs of a single, similar size in an array, and it's like five of around this size, and you get a millimeter by a millimeter. Um, so those devices exist. We are just working on getting them to our lab and testing them. Great uh, talk, Stefan. Um, Thanks. The one photon per day dark rate refers to that mass. Uh, uh, is that for this for uh, Yes, for so the, this estimate is for, for this device. Um. Thank you. Um, hi, thanks for the great talk. Over uh, here. Where? Ah, there. perfect. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the when you showed the four gigahertz bandwidth, because um, maybe I missed it, and maybe it's on the slide. And Do you mean here, or which? I know, um, when you showed the data acquisition. Uh, or in data. Right. Um, I wanted to ask, how, what's your resolution in the 4 gigahertz um, per channel, basically? So you need uh, 10 to the minus 6 times the frequency, so it's like 10 kilohertz. Okay, that's your per channel resolution. Yeah, so you have like, I think it's a 5 
500,000 points in your spectrum. Okay. Five, okay. Um, you can increase the resolution mm -hmm. as much as you want, but um, y so you're not limited by the sampling rate, but you're limited by how much memory your board yeah. has. Yeah. So then you have to go to a smaller bandwidth. But right now you're working with 500,000 in the four yeah. gigahertz. Yeah. Okay. Um, just one other question was um, in this bandwidth, how are you planning on searching for a signal? Um, um, well, basically, um, you are just putting your um, antenna there and digitize um, the signal that's arriving at your antenna. Um, we can move the antenna in and out of the focus spot and modulate our signal. So that's um, what we will do. So a signal that's really a signal should be modulated with the antenna position. So we can reject backgrounds that don't modulate. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the great talk, Japan. So, uh, looking at the you know the project uh, sensitivity plot, uh, even if we don't see that, but I see that you know uh, low bound and upper bound are very sharply defined. But you guys, this is a broadband search. Yeah. So this is a uh, this is on purpose, or, or this is the you know, feature feature of the experiment. Um, very sharp, sharp you know boundaries, low bound oh, and the, upper the bound. Oh, the sharp boundaries here, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, the short boundaries are just given by, you know, the maximum bandwidth that you can put your DAC to, like your receiver chain. Um, we are limited by that. Uh, so if you want to increase it, you know, you scan three years, uh, three years, three months in one band and then three months in the next band, or you have two receiver chains that you connect to the same and both um, are tuned to another frequency okay. range. Okay, this is from, uh, because of the read, read, readout setup. Yeah, right? okay. due to yeah. the limitations okay, of, of the readout, that's all. So we would love to make this more broadband. <laughs> is there somebody else? Uh, yeah, there was one here because we have still some time. What fraction of the photons that are produced inside your volume are actually collected on your detector? It seems to me that at high frequencies, you're trying to image a very large volume onto a very small detector. I'm wondering how much the phase space acceptance of your detector is. Um, so the SNSPDs have actually a relatively good quantum efficiency. Um, the main background for the SNSPDs are the dark cons from the SNSPD that um, if you talk to SNSPD experts, they don't really um, fully understand them. Sorry, it's hard to understand you from so. <laughs> Oh, the, the acceptance. Yeah, so for us, it's very important to study, you know, the um, dependence on the incident angle of the light. So maybe that's what your question is aiming at. We actually are performing simulations of that right now. So far, it actually looks relatively good. So these SNSPDs don't seem to have such a high dependence on incident angle. Um, that's why we are continuing to pursue this at all. Otherwise, we would put some more uh, secondary um, optics to make it more normal incidence. But this would widen the focal spot, so you would need a larger SNSPD. There is still some time for our last question. Hello, thank you for a great talk. Uh, on this plot right here, maybe I missed it, but what causes uh, your range to broaden horizontally with additional clock? Oh, so um, I mean, here we just you know, this, this just assumes that we change the band of our digitizer to another frequency band and repeat the measurement for another three months in another uh, frequency band. We can do this in three months if we have three digitizers. <laughs> um. Is that not a very, it, it, I'm, I'm a naive theorist, but it would sound like given that your detector is broadband, it, you would, it would seem like you could do all three of these at the same time. Uh, you can, you can. If you have three, um, three digitization boards, you can connect them all to your antenna and, um, after, of course, some sufficient amplification and do all three at the same time, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>